Once again, we welcome you to Moving Forward with Young Voices. Very happy to welcome Brian Hawkins to the program. Brian is a Young Voices contributor, and I'm guessing that's not the only hat that you wear. Tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do. Awesome. Thank you for having me, Brian. Um, Brian Hawkins, I work for People United for Privacy, P, uh, PUFP. PUFP is a relatively new organization, at least in our current um, um, construction. But um, but yeah, so we're an organization dedicated to protecting the right to privately donate to nonprofit organizations, um, donor privacy in short. So we do this primarily through educating policymakers, building coalitions around this issue, um, and 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 you know building building uh, um, educating just key partners on on why donor privacy is important and leading leading that public advocacy on protecting donor privacy rights. You know, believe it or not, there was there was a brief period of time where I was a development officer for a think tank, and my job was to reach out to people who philanthropically wanted to make donations to our nonprofit, and uh, and it was, I was astonished at the amount of money that that actually is donated each year. I mean, if you've never been exposed to the nonprofit side, you'd probably be very surprised at how much. Um, people are freely giving to causes that they support. Now, Brian, keeping that in mind, why is it a bad idea for those donors who wish to remain private, and many do because it's philanthropic, why is it a big deal if, if their privacy is uh, is not there, if their names are made public? So I want to note, I always love talking to Devo people about this issue because they understand it even better than my fellow policy wonks <laughs> dealing with a lot of donors. And, uh, but yeah, but that's a great question. There's... There's lots of very good reasons why people want to keep their donation anonymous. Um, one reason is just that um, from, from a purely um, fundraising side, a lot of donors, they don't want to solicit, receive a lot of solicitation from other people on the type of donations they give to. Um, another reason, though, is just facing um, harassment and threats of intimidation from, from radical activists. If you're giving to a highly politicized issue, of course, opponents on the other side are going to want to um, identify you, get tracked down your housing, your 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 home address, your telephone number, and, and dox you and harass you and, and, and intimidate you. We see this all the time. We um, There's plenty of instances, which we talk about, of donors of having their information publicly released, um, leaked by government agencies, state attorney generals, the IRS, and then facing all types of, of of being inundated with threats, people coming to their place of business, people coming to their home, um, and protesting them because they they chose to exercise their First Amendment right of giving to a particular organization. So, so yeah, it's a serious threat. And one thing to note uh, when speaking of donors is that people have this people. Um, fail to realize that they that they are donors themselves a lot of times when we use the term donor it's difficult to use because people think the billionaires and if you're talking to a progressive they're going to think the evil Koch brothers or if you're talking to a, 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 a conservative they're thinking about george Soros. so like oh those are the yeah. donors but it's like you're a donor too uh my wife and i we donate to a local um pet shelter um if you donate to your church you donate to many other uh, good causes pregnancy centers Planned Parenthood, whatever, but like all of us, we donate to different causes that we care about. So we want to make sure that your right to privately donate to the causes you believe in are protected. And we've seen what happens when when the the mob gets a, a you know idea we need to cancel this person, and and some of the yes. things that people get canceled for are just ridiculous. Now, having said that, Brian, tell me what is in the water that there are thirty one states considering legislation that would actually work to remove that privacy for those donors? Yes, lots of bad things. Um, as, as I imply towards, it's very um, easy to demagogue this issue. Once again, you know, all the bad guys are donating to things that, that I don't like. So therefore, I want to disclose their donors. So what my colleagues did, Matt Neese and Alex Bayako, they, they published this memo identifying um, um, threats to donor, donor privacy in the states. Um, it's a, it's an extensive memo. It's very informative. Um, and basically what it identifies is 31 states where donor privacy 
um, is is being threatened right now. So uh, a few states that immediately come to mind, um, Arizona, Oklahoma, Oregon, um, Ohio, um, Maine, and Virginia, though those have been some present threats. Some have already been resolved. Some have gone in very bad directions for us. Um, but those, those are some of the biggest threats that we highlight in this report where lawmakers are pushing legislation in order to threaten donor privacy rights. And um, so let me let me say real quick, it probably won't be that quick, uh, but I think one of the biggest threats that we discuss um, is in Arizona and actually passed two years ago. So Arizona implemented this ballot measure, Prop 211, um, and, and it was passed um, overwhelmingly, unfortunately, but it passed with, and it, it poses this very restrictive donor disclosure regime where um, it has this concept called original source disclosure. So not only does it want to know the people who are donating to the nonprofit, if a don if a, if a nonprofit donates to another organization that engages in some type of public advocacy, then that nonprofit has to engage has to donate. Um, um, disclose their own donors, even if their donors did not contribute to the public advocacy. So it's very intrusive. It empowers the Arizona um, Clean, the Citizens Clean Elections Commission with just overwhelming um, authority to, to prosecute, investigate um, individuals accused of violating this law. Um, it's facing three different lawsuits right now. Um, challenging the constitutionality of it. One of it is coming from state lawmakers saying that this bill is, that this law is usurping their legislative powers. Another one comes from um, our friends at the Goldwater Institute that says the um, um, it violates the state constitution. And then another lawsuit comes from our friends at uh, Americans for Prosperity Foundation, um, who is an active player. Their name was South familiar based upon some prior Supreme Court precedent. I'll spare all those details from now. All that to say that there are three different lawsuits challenging this Arizona law. And the scary thing now is, though, is two, three other states are now trying to pass versions of the same law that's facing tremendous constitutional scrutiny. Wow. I I was sad to see that uh, my home state of Idaho is one of those states that's uh, considering such legislation as well. Very yeah, disappointing. Well, Idaho... Idaho was very disappointing. Um, late last year, it was over the Christmas break, they, the state party, if I remember correctly, passed a resolution saying that they're going to ban dark money. Of course, dark money was poorly defined and would oppose all types of constitutional issues. So I don't, I'm not sure if um, it has manifested in any legislative proposals yet. I know there's been things circulating in Idaho, but that was one of the core uh, manifestations is that is that party resolution to ban dark money. Um, and of course, dark money being things that are bad for free speech. I, I am so glad you brought up that term because I hear it all the time. Well, you know, that's just a dark money funded campaign. And, and I, I assume they're just leaving it to our own emotional associations. Ooh, dark money. Yeah. They never really tell me what it means, but I can imagine <laughs> uh, it's money. It's dark. It's not bright. Money. I mean, what? I, I don't know. It seems like it seems dark. like code word for be afraid of this, whatever it is. Yeah, that, that, that's exactly what it is. Dark money is, is things I don't like. And unfortunately, <laughs> like, 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 like I've mentioned before, it's, it's, it's uh, easy to demagogue for, for both sides. No one likes dark money. It sounds scary, but when they're talking about dark money, what they, what they're really um, trying to get at is people who are privately donating to causes they believe in. So whenever you hear the term dark money, it's a, it's a raise it's a raise a red flag in your head, but for different reasons. Is that yeah. they're 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 trying to manipulate your emotions to to really infringe on free speech and First Amendment rights. So we've got about one minute left here. Let's take a moment to uh, direct our audience to where can they get good, reliable information. For instance, talk about to, about your website where people can access this this paper that that was written. It really is informative. It'll 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 help you better understand what's up. Awesome. Thank you for that promotion. Um, you can find our website at unitedforprivacy.com. I say again, unitedforprivacy.com, or just Google us, People United for Privacy Foundation, um, or just People United for Privacy. Um, yeah, we, we, we're we always publishing content. Um, sign up for our emails. We have our, our weekly media alert where we 
just give you a rundown every week of what's happening in the donor privacy world, the good things and the bad things, and just commentary. Um, yeah, we are your go-to source for all things related to donor privacy. So if you're interested in learning more, you can always reach out. Okay, and uh, Brian Hawkins, let's talk about where can people find you and follow you on social media. LinkedIn is going to be the primary source. I uh, I gave up Twitter for Lint, so I am down on Twitter for now. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I'm still active on LinkedIn, and that's where I share a lot of our um, a lot of our content. Okay, again, we've been talking with Brian Hawkins. Thank you so much. Very informative. I look forward to our next conversation. Awesome. Thank you for having me. Welcome back. This is segment number three for today's Moving Forward with Young Voices. Very happy to welcome a uh, new contributor. His name is Mickey Horstman. Checking in from uh, from Chicago, Illinois. And uh, Mickey, if you take just a moment, tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do. Yeah, I want to start with thank you for having me on. I am the Communications Associate for Illinois Policy, which is the advocacy arm for the Illinois Policy Institute, which is a think tank based in Chicago, and we're the leading voice of taxpayers um, in Illinois. Sounds like the taxpayers <laughs> need somebody to be watching their back these days. I was not living in, in Illinois. I was not aware of uh, Chicago Mayor Johnson's uh, uh real estate tax, but talk to me about this this referendum that's being proposed. First of all, this is not something that happens every election year, but what exactly is the mayor asking for? Yeah, um, so Chicago voters have the opportunity to vote on Mayor Brandon Johnson's proposal to increase the real estate transfer tax, which is a tax um, on the beginning of uh, it's a it's a one time tax on property sales. Um, he wants to increase the tax rate over um, for properties listed over a million dollars. And uh, this isn't the first city to uh, Chicago isn't the first city to try and implement this tax. We've seen this kind of sweep the nation. It's this new progressive tax that we're seeing. Um, other big cities, including L.A., have recently introduced one. Chicago has one. This is just a proposal to increase that rate. Um, so Johnson has outlined this plan as a mansion tax. Um, I previously mentioned L.A., which has a very different layout um, for residents than a city like Chicago, which primarily focuses um, their residents in apartment buildings and multifamily townhouses and mixed storefronts and high rise apartments. So we don't have the traditional mansion that um, a place like L.A. has. So what this really is, is a tax on businesses because commercial businesses account for the value of transactions over a million dollars by a nine to one ratio which means that it's going to be small businesses like mom and pop shops and bars and restaurants that are actually going to bear the majority of this tax and are going to be paying for it in the long run. Mm. <laughs> it's, it's just proving out that uh, that age old economic truth of, you know, the, the cost is always passed on to to the consumer. So the question is, will the consumers, though, will the will the residents of Chicago start to notice their coffee costing more, their sandwiches, their groceries and so forth? Um, are, are they prepared to say no? Or do you think there's too too much um, narrowed vision about, you know what, the rich really do need to pay their, their fair share? Yeah, that's the assumption is that, oh, this is going to be a huge wealth tax on this like corporate elite, these big businesses. But what we're seeing in Chicago is actually a mass exodus of these big businesses, places like Boeing, Caterpillar, um, Tyson Foods, these historic Chicago big businesses are have all left in the past two years. So what this is really going to do is impact the entrepreneurs, the entry level businesses. It's going to increase the cost for them significantly. Um, and they're the leading job creators, actually, in Illinois since the pandemic. Small businesses account for the majority of new job growth since um, the 2020 pandemic. So this will be a deterrent to individuals looking to start businesses 
And in turn, they're going to pass these costs off to the consumers. And whether that is in forms of higher rent, if it's something for like building a residential property or a big um, high rise apartment, rents could go up. Or if it's somewhere like a restaurant or a bar, you can definitely expect to see the costs of these goods increase. Okay, so talk to me about uh, what are, what are the mayor's intended uses for this uh, this new revenue that uh, that will be raised by by raising those taxes. Yeah, so he's advertised this as uh, his attempt to address homelessness in the city, which is an, um, is a great cause. It's obviously something that Chicago has been dealing with, an increased rise in homelessness and a homelessness crisis. Um, we've also become the center of attention for a migrant crisis. And this is his means of raising funds to address that. However, the city already contributes um, multi-millions of dollars towards addressing these issues. In the 2024 budget, Johnson allocated $400 million for homelessness and homeless migrants. In addition, the city is sitting on $44 million unused federal dollars that were advocated for homelessness. They got a HUD grant a few years ago for affordable housing. So there is existing money for to address these issues. So it's not a question of if there's money for it. It's a question of how are we spending the money? So Johnson has this idea that this will go towards homelessness, but he hasn't really addressed how he plans on doing that. So currently there is no plan for the money that he hopes to raise. And I think a lot of Chicago voters are confused that this is going to be like a one-time tax increase when this is going to be a permanent increase to the taxes. So they've projected that this could bring in a hundred million dollars, but we don't know that that's true. In LA, we saw the sales of high-end properties plummet, which resulted in them not being able to meet their tax revenue, which is another issue with this type of taxation is that it's expected and we don't know how it will play out. And when you're gambling with something like real estate in a city like Chicago, it's more likely than not that it's not going to go the mayor's way. So currently he can set up this money for a slush fund, which allows him to move the money around as long as it loosely addresses homelessness is how it's currently written, which mm -hmm. means that it could go to things like guaranteed income programs or more migrant housing funds. Um, recently, the Chicago Teachers Union, who was the leading backer of Mayor Johnson's campaign, has made a play for what they want the money for, which is for housing stipends for teachers who are not homeless. So we wow. really have idea where this money could be going it's like there's no there's no end to the line right mm -hmm. people lined up well once once the rich start paying their share we should be able to get on now you mentioned that los angeles actually tried this and and did not have such a good experience um is chicago likely to learn from that or do they feel like well they're just the wrong people doing it we'll get it this time because it sounds like they're setting themselves up for the same exact problem yeah, we haven't seen this type of taxation play out successfully very often throughout the U.S. So Los Angeles is a good example of a place where it didn't work. We saw a bunch of high-end properties go on the market right before the tax was going to go into effect. They sold, and then the city missed out on all that revenue. And then as soon as the tax was implemented, oh, all of a sudden, no more houses are being sold. So that's a huge concern, especially for Chicago, where we're already dealing with record high vacancies. People are exiting. Businesses are fleeing. So as a deterrent to that, the mayor wants to add another tax on business. It, it just doesn't make sense for the city. And in the meantime, I think as you had pointed out, there there really is a, a homeless problem. And, and Chicago, th there are homeless people who need that help right now. How might the heat be turned up under the mayor and those uh, who sit on those, you know, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of dollars that, that could be used for those purposes right now? Yeah, well, currently Mayor Johnson isn't a very popular mayor. He's actually the lowest rated approval, has the lowest approval rating of any if first year mayor that the city has recorded. So there is already a big, pre like an added pressure on him to come up with good ways to appease his progressive base. But the issue is that this isn't going to do that. It's going to actually backfire and the majority of the tax will be paid by the individuals that he's trying to appease, right? We'll see that in the higher costs of the goods. 
So there's a huge trust issue already with Johnson. He has already moved funds around from other programs. Um, he took $95 million that was supposed to be used for COVID relief and gave it towards migrant funding. Um, and he did that without the consent of the Chicago City Council. So he already has shown that he's not a very trustworthy mayor. So um, providing additional opportunities for him to take permanent a permanent tax hike and take a, a slush fund of money from Chicagoans every year doesn't seem like it's in the best interest for Chicago residents. I want to use the word racket, but I can't think of using it in a way that doesn't sound somehow mean. So I won't. But wow. <laughs> Isn't it interesting how everything seems to work out really well for the mayor and uh, those who are well connected with him, you know, under these circumstances? I'm just saying, what a what an amazing coincidence. He must be very happy. Oh, yeah. He's, <laughs> uh, he's really lined himself up for a long-term success, I'm sure. Again, we are talking with uh, Mickey Horstman. Uh, Mickey is a Young Voices contributor. And, and Mickey, if you would. Tell us where, where can people follow your work? And in fact, for that matter, where can they follow you on social media? Yeah, you can follow me on Twitter at Mickey underscore Horseman, or you can follow my work at IllinoisPolicy.org. All right. Very good. Great to catch up with you. And I, I expect we're going to have a chance to talk a little bit later this year. I'm, I'm very interested to hear uh, what else is going on, you know, in, in your neck of the woods. Yep. Lots to happen in Chicago. So hopefully we can flush out some more. Thank you for having me on. Thank you. Welcome back. This is segment number three for today's Moving Forward with Young Voices. Very happy to welcome a uh, new contributor. His name is Mickey Horstman. Checking in from uh, from Chicago, Illinois. And uh, Mickey, if you take just a moment, tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do. Yeah, I want to start with thank you for having me on. I am the communications associate for Illinois Policy, which is the advocacy arm for the Illinois Policy Institute, which is a think tank based in Chicago. And we're the leading voice of taxpayers um, in Illinois. Sounds like the taxpayers <laughs> need somebody to be watching their back these days. I was not living in, in Illinois. I was not aware of uh, Chicago Mayor Johnson's uh, uh, real estate tax. But talk to me about this, this referendum that's being proposed. First of all, this is not something that happens every election year. But what exactly is the mayor asking for? Yeah. Um, so Chicago voters have the opportunity to vote on Mayor Brandon Johnson's proposal to increase the real estate transfer tax, which is a tax um, on the beginning of uh, it's a it's a one time tax on property sales. Um, he wants to increase the tax rate over um, for properties listed over a million dollars. And uh, this isn't the first city to, uh, Chicago isn't the first city to try and implement this tax. We've seen this kind of sweep the nation. It's this new progressive tax that we're seeing. Um, other big cities, including LA, have recently introduced one. Chicago has one. This is just a proposal to increase that rate. Um, so Johnson has outlined this plan as a mansion tax. Um, I previously mentioned LA which has a very different layout um, for residents than a city like Chicago, which primarily focuses um, their residents in apartment buildings and multifamily townhouses and mixed storefronts and high rise apartments. So we don't have the traditional mansion that um, a place like LA has. So what this really is, is a tax on businesses because Commercial businesses account for the value of transactions over a million dollars by a nine to one ratio, which means that it's going to be small businesses like mom and pop shops and bars and restaurants that are actually going to bear the majority of this tax and are going to be paying for it in the long run. Mm. <laughs> It's it's just proving out that uh, that age old economic truth of you know the the cost is always passed on to to the consumer. So the question is, will the consumers though will the will the residents of Chicago start to notice their coffee costing more, their sandwiches, their groceries, and so forth? Um, are are they prepared to say no? 
or do you think there's too too much um, narrowed vision about you know what the rich really do need to pay their their fair share? Yeah, that's the assumption is that oh, this is going to be a huge wealth tax on this like corporate elite, these big businesses. But what we're seeing in Chicago is actually a mass exodus of these big businesses, places like Boeing, Caterpillar, um, Tyson Foods. These historic Chicago big businesses are have all left in the past two years. So what this is really going to do is impact the entrepreneurs, the entry level businesses. It's going to increase the cost for them significantly. Um, and they're the leading job creators, actually, in Illinois since the pandemic. Small businesses account for the majority of new job growth since um, the 2020 pandemic. So this will be a deterrent to individuals looking to start businesses. And in turn, they're going to pass these costs off to the consumers. And whether that is in forms of higher rent, if it's something for like building a residential property or a big um, high rise apartment, rents could go up. Or if it's somewhere like a restaurant or a bar, you can definitely expect to see the costs of these goods increase. Okay, so talk to me about uh, what are, what are the mayor's intended uses for this uh, this new revenue that uh, that will be raised by by raising those taxes. Yeah, so he's advertised this as uh, his attempt to address homelessness in the city, which is an, um, is a great cause. It's obviously something that Chicago has been dealing with, an increased rise in homelessness and a homelessness crisis. Um, we've also become the center of attention for a migrant crisis. And this is his means of raising funds to address that. However, the city already contributes um multi-millions of dollars towards addressing these issues in the 2024 budget. Johnson allocated $400 million for homelessness and homeless migrants. In addition, the city is sitting on $44 million unused federal dollars that were advocated for homelessness. They got a HUD grant a few years ago for affordable housing. So there is existing money for to address these issues. So it's not a question of if there's money for it. It's a question of how are we spending the money? So Johnson has this idea that this will go towards homelessness, but he hasn't really addressed how he plans on doing that. So currently there is no plan for the money that he hopes to raise. And I think a lot of Chicago voters are confused that this is going to be like a one-time tax increase when this is going to be a permanent increase to the taxes. So they've projected that this could bring in a hundred million dollars, but we don't know that that's true. In LA, we saw the sales of high-end properties plummet, which resulted in them not being able to meet their tax revenue, which is another issue with this type of taxation is that it's expected and we don't know how it will play out. And when you're gambling with something like real estate in a city like Chicago, it's more likely than not that it's not going to go the mayor's way. So currently he can set up this money for a slush fund, which allows him to move the money around as long as it loosely addresses homelessness is how it's currently written, which mm -hmm. means that it could go to things like guaranteed income programs or more migrant housing funds. Um, recently, the Chicago Teachers Union, who was the leading backer of Mayor Johnson's campaign, has made a play for what they want the money for, which is for housing stipends for teachers who are not homeless. So we wow. really have idea where this money could be going it's like there's no there's no end to the line right mm -hmm. people lined up well once once the rich start paying their share we should be able to get on now you mentioned that los angeles actually tried this and and did not have such a good experience um is chicago likely to learn from that or do they feel like well they're just the wrong people doing it we'll get it this time because it sounds like they're setting themselves up for the same exact problem yeah, we haven't seen this type of taxation play out successfully very often throughout the U.S. So Los Angeles is a good example of a place where it didn't work. We saw a bunch of high-end properties go on the market right before the tax was going to go into effect. They sold, and then the city missed out on all that revenue. And then as soon as the tax was implemented, oh, all of a sudden, no more houses are being sold. So that's a huge concern, especially for Chicago, where we're already dealing with record high vacancies. People are exiting. Businesses are fleeing. So as a deterrent to that, the mayor wants to add another tax on business. It, it just doesn't make sense for the city. And in the meantime, I think as you had pointed out, they're 
there really is a, a homeless problem in, in Chicago. Th- there are homeless people who need that help right now. How might the heat be turned up under the mayor and those uh, who sit on those, you know, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of dollars that, that could be used for those purposes right now? Yeah, well, currently Mayor Johnson isn't a very popular mayor. He's actually the lowest rated approval, has the lowest approval rating of any first year mayor that the city has recorded. So there is already a big, like an added pressure on him to come up with good ways to appease his progressive base. But the issue is that this isn't going to do that. It's going to actually backfire and the majority of the tax will be paid by the individuals that he's trying to appease, right? We'll see that in the higher costs of the goods. So there's a huge trust issue already with Johnson. He has already moved funds around from other programs. Um, He took $95 million that was supposed to be used for COVID relief and gave it towards migrant funding. Um, And he did that without the consent of the Chicago City Council. So he already has shown that he's not a very trusted trustworthy mayor. So um, providing additional opportunities for him to take permanent a permanent tax hike and take a, a slush fund of money from Chicagoans every year doesn't seem like it's in the best interest for Chicago residents. I want to use the word racket, but I can't think of using it in a way that doesn't sound somehow mean. So I won't, but Wow. (laughs) Isn't it interesting how everything seems to work out really well for the mayor and uh, those who are well connected with him, you know, under these circumstances? I'm just saying what a what an amazing coincidence. He must be very happy. Oh, yeah. He's uh, (laughs) he's really lined himself up for a long term success, I'm sure. Again, we are talking with uh, Mickey Horstman. Uh, Mickey is a Young Voices contributor. and, And Mickey, if you would. Tell us, where where can people follow your work? And in fact, for that matter, where can they follow you on social media? Yeah, you can follow me on Twitter at Mickey underscore Horseman, or you can follow my work at IllinoisPolicy.org. All right. Very good. Great to catch up with you. And I I expect we're going to have a chance to talk a little bit later this year. I'm I'm very interested to hear uh, what else is going on, you know, in, in your neck of the woods. Yep. Lots to happen in Chicago. So hopefully we can flush out some more. Thank you for having me on. Thank you. Welcome back. This is our fourth and final segment on Moving Forward with Young Voices today. Hey, I want to welcome Nate Phipps. He is a Young Voices contributor. Nate, this is your first time on the show, so I'm going to ask you, in the tradition of getting you better acquainted with our audience, tell us just a little bit about who you are and what you do. Hey, Brian. Thank you for having me on. So I currently am a Young Voices contributor. I work in digital marketing and the freedom movement as my full-time occupation. And even though I work in state policy, I have a passion for uh, foreign policy and international affairs. And that's really what I'm focusing on at Young Voices. All right. I'm looking at an article that you had published in International Policy Digest. Um, and political partisanship is hurting our reputation abroad. I know it, things have been uncomfortable here at home thanks to the political partisanship. I haven't thought much about to what the effect is abroad. Uh, walk us through what's what's happening in terms of, of America's reputation thanks to all this uh, this partisan infighting. Yeah, so my concern is is that our allies, as well as maybe nations that are not so friendly to the U.S., are taking a look at what's going on at home. They see that our border is not being addressed, and they see that we're not able to give consistent aid to our allies. And I fear that, you know, if you think of each nation having a credit score, except instead of having to do with finances, it has to do with dependability as an ally, political partnership is causing our score to go down. Wow. So has has this ever been the case before? It seems like there have been other times where, where we had some pretty divergent voices, particularly on foreign policy. Or is this fairly uncharted territory, you know, for, for the kind of partisanship that we're seeing? You know, I think there's nothing new under the sun. I think we've seen it before. I think that, you know, partisanship is not all bad. Edmund Burke made the point that partisanship is a way for political entities to try to figure out what's best for the nation. I think what we're seeing right now is that the parties are not able to compromise. 
and that uh, most Americans don't necessarily want just the Democrat or just the Republican vision for dealing with the border crisis. They're somewhere in the middle. A poll from the Bullfinch Group showed that 76% of Americans want both compassionate immigration and stronger borders. But it seems that right now, both parties are trying to focus on their wish lists rather than the will of the American people. And I think it's time for us as Americans to remind them they work for us, not the other way around. Okay, what about our foreign policy? Um, Let's talk about some of the places where we're seeing uh, partisanship uh, exhibit itself there. Yeah, so a big area is with Israel and Ukraine, and there is a big debate on how much should we continue, should we even continue to grant money to these states at all. And really in my article, I wasn't trying to say one way or the other. I think that, you know, the American people can hash that out. What I'm trying to say is that we need to be consistent. If our government says they're going to do something, we need to follow through and do it. And I think that especially under the Biden administration, we just haven't had that track record. And America really desperately needs to get back on track with doing what we say we're going to do. Now, where does where where do we allow, though, for for, I think there there are some honest differences, for instance, in in foreign policy. Should America be the world's policeman? Should we be out there, as Pat Buchanan put it, night sticking the troublemakers, you know, to to get people back in line? Or is is there a different way to go about it? I'm concerned when I when I hear about uh, you know CIA involvement in in various uh, you know uprisings and so forth, I, and I I have to wonder you know okay I I think we're we're pretty much known as a force for good throughout the world. I'd like to continue to see America's reputation you know maintained at that level, but sometimes things come to light that show that what the political class wants versus what the citizens of America expect or want are are two very different things. Yeah, absolutely. And I I think we see that again in this, that lawmakers are trying to push forth policy that's rammed together. Why is policy for the border and policy for foreign aid, why are they together at all? Why are these not separate issues? And for example, figuring out the border should not cause policy for our allies to be held up. One should not stop the other from moving forward. So I don't think policy bundling, which is what this phenomenon is called, is all bad. But I think in this case, it's an example of where each party is trying to just get their wish list rather than settle and figure out a path forward that's going to help our allies and going to keep our borders where they need to be. Is is there any... Is there any... um incentive for for either side to to budge being as it's an election year it seems like if anything those uh, those passions and those inclinations get even more intense and people uh, become even further entrenched are, are are we are we basically pushing a rock uphill doing this in you know to have that kind of thought in an election year or uh, is there ever a good time for for the you know both sides to settle down and, and try to find common ground yeah i think being an election year is absolutely going to cause more partisanship and politicians have to do what they have to do to appease their base in order to get votes. And I think instead of trying to force politicians to act in a way that they're not, we as the American people can take that as a moment and say, hey, let's be a little bit more reflective. Let's not point fingers. Let's realize that even lawmakers in our own party sometimes don't have the best interests of our state in mind and that we can take a moment to be reflective. I don't think the majority of people are going to do this, but I hope that through reading my article, at least a few people will take my message and say, hey, you know, let's take a look at what both parties are doing and understand maybe how there's room to meet in the middle and that we can encourage our lawmakers, contact our lawmakers and encourage them to do so. Yeah, I, I'll i admit, and this is just, you know, for me, and if, if this sounds, uh, you know, a bit strident, I'm, I'm feeling pretty passionate about I don't feel like Washington, D.C. represents my interests, at least as a common person, which, you know, are simply, I'd like government to get out of the way as much as possible so that I can pursue life, liberty, and happiness on, on my own terms. I want the same for everybody else, but it seems like uh, the the goals of the political class, whether Republican or Democrat, um, don't seem to have that much in common with, with what, uh, you know, an average citizen would would want or ex- expect from government. And, and I wonder how much of that has to do with, you know, the way the media leads us to, to think about 
certain events to where, you know, I know for a lot of people, the most important thing that's going on today is what did Donald Trump tweet? And I'm sure that there's other things in their world that are important too, but that's where their attention is. You know, I think that we are seeing, like you said, that politicians are rather tone deaf to what the average American is concerned about. Uh, Americans are concerned about getting good education for their kids. They're concerned about the price of gas, the price of milk. And I think what we're seeing is that a lot of politicians across the board are just tone deaf to those concerns. And, you know, I think that this election season is really the opportunity for us as the American people to communicate to the government that, hey, you need to take care of our concerns and make sure that our families can prosper and, you know, find ways to get people into office so we'll keep government out of the way. And sometimes it feels like there there are people out there who I believe would fit that description. You just get, they, you know, they want to keep government to its proper, you know, role, limited, there to uh, preserve our rights and so forth. But for some reason, those people seem very hard to elect. It's like, it's almost like the system um, circles the wagons, make sure we know now that's, that's pretty dangerous. We need to keep things right as they are to make sure that every, everything is safe and, and working. And I think a lot of voters buy into that without too much afterthought. You know, sometimes it can feel safe to just keep doing things as we're doing, but I think the reality of entrepreneurship as, you know, the freedom movement loves to think about is that sometimes there has to be a little bit of creative destruction. There has to be Mm-hmm. There has to be some change. There has to, something has to give. And I think that we're getting to the point to where, especially as the younger generation gets older, that we're just going to see differences in government. We're not going to do things the way we've always done them. And so even though things are not great right now, I am optimistic about where we're going and what we'll see in our government down the road. I do like that term creative destruction. And and some people may hear that and think, oh, that sounds terribly scary. But you know, if you think about uh, ride sharing, there's there's an example of what uh, creative um, destruction looks like. You know, suddenly, if you didn't want to ride in the in the back of a filthy taxi cab, you had an option and one that actually you know made economic sense. That's that's one example. Now, how this applies to you know some of the policies and some of the the things that we've uh, talked about in this segment, I don't know, Nate. I I'd, I'd sure love to see it though. Absolutely, and I think that you know as we begin to apply these principles to our foreign policy, we'll see that, you know, there will be more choice, that there will be the ability to not have to choose either compassionate immigration or border security. I don't see any reason why we can't have both and why we can't, on the other side, decide how we're going to stand with our allies and continue to do so. And, you know, like you said, there is room for that debate, you know, what should the American place be in foreign policy? Should we continue to have such a strong presence in the world? You know, at the very least in the Red Sea, we're seeing a lot of disruption with international shipping. I think there's a strong case to be made that our place, at least in terms of being the guarantor of uh, being able to ship overseas, is good for our economy and good for us as well. Okay. We are up against the clock again. We're talking with Nate Phipps. Um, Nate, for people who want to follow you on social media or otherwise follow your work, where can they find you? Yeah, I am uh, on Twitter. I'm not super active on Twitter. Um, I'm actually under the name of Nathaniel Phipps, which is in my article. And then uh, you can also follow me on Instagram, where I'm just Nate Phipps, and then on LinkedIn as well.